is Kent giving the message from? Well, I'm back here, over here. And the reason I'm back here is because I need to hear this message just as much as you guys. So I figured I'd be sitting here among the congregation and listening to my message. But it'd be kind of uncomfortable for you to kind of like turn around the whole time. So I'll go up. But while I go up, I want you to look very carefully at the things that I have. Look carefully. I have a cat. I have a basketball jersey with number 23 on it. Now, if you're from recent generation, you'll remember 23 is what LeBron James wore when he was with the Cleveland Cavaliers and when he first joined the Lakers. But if you're from my era, you'll remember number 23 is actually Bulls, Michael Jordan. And then you're going to see the third thing I have, which is a cross, which I'm going to bear on my back as I come forward. So remember, you're looking, looking at the cat, number 23, and the cross. Now, what could that have to do with our message today? Well, let me tell you. What? How many lives does a cat have? Nine. Okay? So you're going to remember the number nine, and you're going to remember the number 23. And remember I said, I want you to look, look carefully. So that's going to remind you of Luke 9, 23. Now, the cross, you're going to see the verse, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So now you're going to have this picture in your mind. If you have this picture in your mind, this is how I do it. I think of a giant cat. On top of the cat is riding Michael Jordan. And on the back of Michael Jordan is this cross. So then I'll think of, okay, starting from the bottom, 9, 23, taking up the cross. And you're going to remember this verse. Okay? So with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we know that your word is life. Your word is truth. And right now, I just pray that our ears would be open, our eyes would be open, our mostly our hearts would be open to hearing the truth in your word this morning, Lord. And not only hearing your word, but that we would be able to put it into practice. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to take this off because otherwise it's going to distract you by my nice cat. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple. What are the requirements of being a disciple? Well, first off, we have to define what's a disciple, right? Well, the disciple is simply someone who learns the principles of their teacher. They are not only just learning the principles of their teacher, though. They are actually putting into practice those principles of the teacher. They're doing what the teacher does. So let's all, for the sake of argument, assume that since you're here on Sunday, that you want to be a disciple of Jesus. So what does it require? Jesus says it requires three things. Number one, first, deny yourself. Number two, take up your cross daily. And number three, follow him. So let's take the first one, deny yourself. What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, a lot of people think that to deny yourself simply means, oh, I'm going to give up, deny myself from, if I like sweets, I'm not going to have any sweets. I'm not going to eat any ice cream for the whole week. Well, maybe I'll have it once. Okay, so other people think, well, maybe it could be social media. I'm going to have a fast. I'm not going to watch any social media or uh, K-dramas for one day out of the week. Okay. Yes, those are good attributes to have to deny yourself if you're going to focus on God. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Think of the words deny and yourself. Two words, deny, give up, and self. It means that you're going to give up your self-will and you're going to embrace God's will. You're giving up your own self-will and you're going to take on God's will. You're going to make God the center of your life in everything that you do, in everything that you think, in everything that you 
in terms of your actions, that's going to be the center of your life. That is what it means to deny yourself. Well, that could be difficult for us. What do we think of when we think of that word deny? We can think of giving up or we can think of surrendering. We put up the white flag. What did we say in our song this morning? We said, hey, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to surrender all to you, Lord. And so it's easy to say I'm going to surrender, but it's awfully difficult to say I'm going to surrender, isn't it? Yet Jesus himself, he gave us the perfect example of what it means to surrender all. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. But yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus was giving up. He was denying himself, his own will, for the will of the Father. And that's what we need to do. But it's so difficult, right? I mean, it's so difficult to surrender all to Jesus because we say, oh, Jesus, we want you to be Lord of all. We want you to be Lord over me in the song we just sang. And yet, is Jesus, we know he's Lord, but is he your Lord? You know, that's what we're asking. Is he truly your Lord? And why is it difficult? Well, it's because we don't want to give up control. I mean, we don't want to give up control in something as easy as, like, say, driving your car. Imagine this. You may not have to imagine too hard. Oh, you know what? I don't feel like driving. Can you drive? Great. OK, I'll just be here in the passenger side. Um, but hey, can you drive a little bit faster? I mean, I've got things that I need to do. Can you go a little faster? Oh, why did you turn there? It would have been much better if you had turned over there. Uh, Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, we got where we needed to go. Why, why are you parking here? It would have been much more convenient if we parked over there, or at least maybe more comfortable. We could have parked in, under the shade. And we all have this nervous laughter because we're thinking, well, yeah, I do that. But don't we do the same thing when we talk to God? We say, God, here you go. I'm going to give you the steering wheel of my life. I'm just going to be here in the passenger seat. You can go ahead and drive, God. Uh, God, can't you go a little bit faster? I mean, I've been praying about this for a week, and I haven't got an answer yet. Uh, God, why are we going down this path? I, I, I'm sure this path would have been better. God, why are you parking me here under this trial? It's not very convenient for me at this time in my life, and, and, and it's certainly not comfortable. And yet that's what we do, right? Because it's so difficult for us to deny ourselves. Why? Because we don't like pain. We don't like discomfort. And yet what does Jesus say? Jesus says, hey, you have to deny yourself. And second thing, take up your cross. What does take up your cross mean? Well, for us today, what does the cross represent? It represents unconditional love, God's grace, God's forgiveness. And those are all great, true qualities of God. But when Jesus said these words, that's not what the cross represented. The cross represented unimaginable, excruciating pain. It also meant humiliation. It meant that you would have to take up your cross, right? And you'd have to take it to the place where you would be nailed to that cross and ultimately die. So Jesus was saying to his disciples at that time, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny your own self-will and you have to be ready to suffer persecution, humiliation in my name, in Jesus', in Jesus name. And so do we want to do that? Do we want to take up our cross daily? Well, the good thing is that Jesus, he gave us the greatest example of taking up the cross, right? He actually went up to Calvary and suffered for us. And why did he do that? Because he loves us. And so, yes, we need to be ready 
to suffer persecution. We need to be ready to suffer humiliation and maybe even rejection for Jesus. But are we willing to do that? Well, let's find out because in our verse today, which comes from Luke chapter what? Nine, verse 23. Good. Let's go to the verse just before that, okay? Let's go to verse 22. It says, Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by who? The elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. So Jesus is saying right there, hey, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to be rejected. That's what he's talking about, right? And then he says, oh, and the Son of Man himself, he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So in this verse that comes just before our verse that we're studying, Jesus is saying, he's predicting that he's going to die on the cross. And then he comes to what he says to them all. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. You guys are going to learn this verse, I know, by the end of my message to you. And then in the next verse, he says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. For what good is it if someone gains the whole world and yet forfeits or loses their very self? So Jesus is saying, you need to look at things in the future. You need to keep your mind on things that have eternal significance. Think of heaven. And so that's what we need to do. And yet, it's difficult for us to do that, right? Because we don't want to suffer persecution. We don't want to suffer pain. But at the very minimum, at the very least, we should be willing to be rejected for our faith in Jesus Christ. And at the very least, we should be able to do the things that Jesus did. We should be willing to at least love other people to serve other people, right? That brings us now to the third requirement. The third requirement is you need to follow him. Okay, so Jesus is saying, follow me. But I'm not talking about superficial following. That's easy. That's just like Jesus coming to um, James and John, Peter and Andrew and saying, hey, come follow me. I'm going to Capernaum. Once we get there, you can do whatever you want. No, Jesus was not saying that. Jesus was saying, I want deep commitment. When he says, follow me, he's telling them, I want you to leave behind your family. I want to leave you to leave behind your profession of fishing. And I want you to come learn from me and follow me. Do the things that I'm doing. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you want to be his disciple, you need to follow him. Not just read the Bible and say, oh yeah, I get what Jesus wants me to do. But follow me means to actually do the things that are written in this book. And that's tough to do, right? So I've given you some good examples of what it means to deny yourself. I've given you a good example of what it means to take up your cross. Jesus did all of those things. So now it comes to, what's the example for follow me? Well, I'm going to give you a bad example. I'm going to tell you the sad, sad story. That's me on the left. <laughs> I'm going to give you the sad story of Kent Nozaki, the selfish eye doctor with a bad attitude. <laughs> a lot of you know that I volunteer for medical missions. And many of you yourselves, you volunteer for medical missions with what uh, the organization is called MMA. And it's a good organization. We supply free of cost medical care, dental care, optical care. So it's a good thing to provide that for people who are homeless, who can't afford it. And that's what we do. But here's what happened a few years back. I was volunteering for the clinic, and they only do it on Saturday, so you devote a Saturday. But I had to 
schedule those Saturdays on the Saturdays that I didn't work at my own office. So now, my Saturdays became very precious to me. And so I would get a little bit selfish about those Saturdays. So what happened is that one Saturday, I found out a month in advance that there was going to be another optometrist that would volunteer at the medical missions clinic in the morning. And so I said, oh, this is good. I can have my Saturday off, and I'm going to do it, spend it by going to Hometown Buffet and enjoying their buffet breakfast. I love their buffet breakfast because you could eat as much as you want, and believe it or not, I can eat a lot. So I was thinking a month in advance, okay, I get to go to Hometown Buffet. I can't go on Sundays because they would only offer the buffet on Saturdays and Sundays. Sundays, I'm here at church. So it only leaves me on Saturdays, but I'm working. But oh, I get this one Saturday off. But guess what happened? One week before the clinic, my wife comes to me and she says to me, Kent, you're going to have to work the medical missions clinic this Saturday. I said, no, I don't have to because there's another optometrist that's going to be there in the morning. She says, no, but our daughter, Jessica, she has to earn service points so that she can graduate from high school. I said, oh, that's no problem. I can drop Jessica off in the morning, and then I can go have my buffet breakfast. And so my wife says, well, what are you doing? Just going to have breakfast? I said, yes. And she says, well, okay, fine. Do whatever you want. Okay. If any of you have been married, you know that when your wife says, fine, do what you want, you better do what she wants, or else your life is not going to be very fine. So... Saturday morning, I can still remember, I was getting in the car, driving to the clinic with this bad attitude, like, oh, what am I doing here? I hadn't even taken hold of the fact that I'm not going to the breakfast that morning. And what happened? Well, as soon as I got to the clinic and I started doing the examinations on people, looking around at the other volunteers that were there and seeing how people that we were helping were truly grateful for what we were doing, I had a change of heart. God changed my selfish heart into a servant's heart. And I knew that I had made the right decision for being there. And as an added bonus, God in the afternoon blessed me by having this one woman patient and while I was examining her right in the middle of doing the, you know, which is better, one or two, she started crying. And then people started turning around and looking like, what did that guy do to her to make her cry? And I asked her, why are you crying? And she said, all my life, I was born with one bad eye. And I never knew that I could see through that eye until just now. And I've never forgotten that experience. And so, what I'm saying is I learned on that day that it is much better to serve others rather than serving myself. And that's actually not something that I learned on that day. You already know that, right? We all know that, and yet I struggle with it every day. I struggle with, gee, am I making a decision that is based upon what I want, or am I making a decision based on eternal significance, on eternal values? something that's going to make a difference in other people's lives. And so that's what it means to follow him. It helps me when I think about, gee, am I making the right decision? Am I making something, a decision based upon something of heavenly value? That's what that verse said, remember? Where Jesus said, hey, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. For what good is it if someone gains the whole world, yet forfeits or loses their very self? And even in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he say, okay, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, God has promised that for those of us who truly will deny ourselves, 
who will take up our cross and follow him. He's promising us the abundant life, the full life. That's what Pastor Dick has been telling us these past few weeks in his sermons. He's saying, hey, if you want a life that's full, if you want a life of joy, what do we need to do? We need to live lives in community, live our lives under God's promises, live our lives marked with gratitude and forgiveness. Those are the basics of what he's been telling us. And so, in conclusion, now we're going to come to the tough part, what they call the fact check. We're going to ask you three questions. Um, next slide. Okay. Here. Have I totally surrendered my life to Jesus? Have I totally surrendered my life? Have I given up my life for Jesus? Question number two. Have I taken up my cross daily? Have I truly made myself open to rejection, open to having some suffering in the name of Jesus? And finally, number three, am I doing what Jesus would do? Am I following Jesus? Not the superficial following, but the deep following. Am I doing what Jesus would do? And if you forget these three questions, it's okay. Because all you have to remember is what? Luke chapter verse? Okay. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's just a rewording of the three questions I gave you. And so... In conclusion, I just want you to know that following Jesus is not easy. It's something that obviously I struggle with every day. And yet I hope that you could see in my example of how I struggled that you could see, okay, there could be hope for Kent. There could be hope for your, my life. Uh, but you could learn from my mistakes, okay? Because... When you give up your life for Jesus, then you're going to find a life that is marked by joy, an abounding life. You're going to find your true purpose in life, and you're going to find a life that has eternal significance. So, let's pray. Dear Lord God, I just want to thank you so much for this message that you've given us. I pray that we would not just listen to your word and think that, yes, I get it, but that we would actually apply your word, that we would put it into practice in our life, that we would be true disciples of you, Lord, not just learning from you, but that we would be doing what you do. Help us to do this with your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.